So I'm going to uh, talk about masting today. And uh, masting is probably familiar to most people working with oaks. Uh, oh, before I get started, uh, the, the work that I'm doing, masting, takes place over long periods of time. Many of the graphs that I show you started in like 1979, and uh, I, I do not age that well. Uh, th this uh, work was started and uh, has been continued by uh, Walter Koenig at, the, at Cornell University, by and large. So, uh, so people that work with oaks know masting well. There are just some years uh, that have very good acorn crops and others uh, that have poor ones. Uh, and uh, so looking around the grounds of the Morton Arboretum over the past couple days, uh, did not see that many acorns on the ground, did not see that many acorn caps on the ground. Uh, so it doesn't seem like it was just squirrels taking them away. Seems like it was kind of a bummer of a year to be an acorn, it, or it just didn't work out very well for it. And we see that. So this is uh, the same general area, didn't get the exact same spot, but this road is covered with acorns in one year and there's uh, rarely an acorn to be found in another year along the same road. And uh, so masting is really important for uh, a lot of different things in the environment. Thinking beyond the oak, uh, we know that many things rely on oak trees. And in particular, a lot of organisms uh, eat acorns. So uh, one particularly interesting uh, study of this uh, comes from out east, uh, where you have the acorn crop. You have rodents, really, are uh, some of the main uh, predators or herbivores of the acorn crop. Uh, so the rise and fall of rodent populations out east tends to track acorn crops reasonably well, with a little bit of a, a lag for their populations. Uh, ticks. Uh, develop when they're young on rodents. Uh, ticks carry Lyme disease. So the prevalence of Lyme disease rises and falls to some degree with the prevalence of acorns out east. So masting drives a, a disease that, that humans get. Uh, and uh, gypsy moth, weirdly enough, rodents tend to eat up the caterpillars when they're young. So rises and fall in gypsy moth populations out east have been connected to acorn crops. Uh, and uh, this is a, a pattern that's uh, all over the world in many different places. Scrub jays, uh, their populations uh, move with acorn crops. Deer, uh, these weevils that we see in acorns, of course, uh, are, rely on them very intimately. Uh, acorn woodpeckers have even come up with great ways of dealing with this boom and bust by storing them inside of these granaries that they make on the side of forest trees. So, uh, so maybe they can, uh, they can keep hold of those acorns during bad times. Uh, people have also done this. So uh, people process acorns for consumption and uh, store them, uh, have done that. Uh, so this is a picture on the uh, left from uh, Miwok community, I believe, in uh, Western North America. And uh, one quote to, to add to, to Beatrice's uh, line of, uh, of quotes of people eating acorns uh, from Europe, the, oh, blessed queen of heaven, didst utterly take away and abolish the food of them old time, the acorn, and now givest man more, better, and milder food. I, I think arguably one of the harder things to deal with with acorns beyond just the processing of them is that there are some years where you just don't find too many, and other years where they're in plenty. So, uh, Masting is something that uh, has uh, several distinct properties. This is uh, a graph showing just the, the number of acorns counted among a bunch of different trees uh, at a site in California for uh, about 30 years. So you can see that there are some really bad years and some really good years. Uh, that's, uh, that's one characteristic of masting in oaks. You can see that it's not like an every other year thing or something like that, uh, where uh, you don't have good year, bad year. You have this kind of irregular pattern of good years and bad years in the oaks. And uh, one pattern that's harder to show with that previous graph is just that there's a really broad distribution where you get synchrony in oak crops between individuals. 
So this is the state of California with red dots being places where people measured acorn crops for uh, about a decade. Uh, and there's somebody there on the right uh, measuring the acorn crop with a pair of binoculars. Uh, this is all in valley oak tree, I believe, so the same species. And uh, on the y-axis here, there's the correlation of acorn production between sites. So if you get a really high number there, that means you, have, you follow the same pattern of boom and bust over time. And if you get a low one, that means you kind of have your own schedules of acorn production. And what you can see is that sites that are close to each other, eh, the trees are pretty synchronous. Sites that are 700 kilometers apart are also pretty darn synchronous in, uh, in their acorn production. So this occurs over huge geographic scales. And uh, so, so just highlighting those, you get high variability in acorn crop, sporadic high and low seed years, and uh, a high synchrony in acorn crop over very large distances. So, uh, yeah. So my question has been, how does this happen? Uh, it, it's a bit of a mystery how uh, trees that are 700 kilometers apart uh, can have synchronous acorn production where they're producing booms and busts of acorn crops uh, all in roughly the same years. Uh, and uh, I've, I'll talk about two ways that I've looked at this. One is uh, looking at valley oaks, uh, a Western Californian white oak, that have looked at the patterns pretty hard to try and understand the mechanisms driving uh, masting. And the other is just to, to try and compare this to what we know for other oak species to see, uh, you know, is what we're finding in valley oaks broadly true or is this something that's a little bit more specific? So the first thing that people have thought for a long time uh, drives masting, and which I, I think is true in, uh, in most oaks, is that uh, there has to be something to do with the internal resources of the year, or it, resources of the oak tree. So I told you that there's not a every other year kind of pattern necessarily, but what there is, is this pattern where if you have a really good year, you tend to have a really bad year after it. Uh, and uh, this is usually attributed to the resources just getting used up uh, over uh, that masting year, and uh, the tree just takes a little while to recover from that. Uh, and you can see this pattern going all throughout that 30-year time series. So, uh, so this was kind of anecdotal evidence from the oaks. And there hasn't been particularly great physiological studies to just show how those resources are being consumed and distributed. In some conifers, there have been, though, and ones that mast. Uh, and there's pretty good evidence from a white bark pine, for example, that nitrogen and phosphorus, you know, two key uh, nutrients, are, are heavily consumed by masting. And not only are they consumed from just the area around where the cones, in this case, are produced, but they're sort of sucked up from the whole tree. Uh, so this would suggest that, uh, uh, yeah, perhaps resources are a really important uh, part of this. So resources really only explain a small portion of this pattern that we see. They can explain that high variability uh, because uh, after having a big seed year, you can have a small one. But they don't really explain the sporadic nature of uh, high or medium seed years. And uh, they certainly don't explain the high synchrony between individuals. There'd be no reason that each tree couldn't just have its own schedule in this case. So uh, the other factor that people have often thought drives masting is uh, what ecologists call the Moran effect and uh, you know, what I, th I think is easier to understand just as weather. That uh, you, uh, weather patterns do occur at scales that are really, really big. So uh, if you are in Oak in Illinois, you're likely experiencing roughly the same weather patterns this year uh, as an Oak in Missouri. If it was a hot spring here, it tends to be a hot spring quite a ways away from here as well. So uh, have uh, kept pretty good weather information, actually exceptionally good weather information for uh, th these populations of Oak trees. 
and have just tried to you know, go through that and find correlates of a good acorn crop. So you know, looked at kind of the usual suspects, how much it's raining, you know, maybe the oaks need a lot of water to produce acorns, and it doesn't really pan out. Uh, looked at kind of a lot of different things, and the one thing that really came out of this was that the temperature in April was a very strong correlate of uh, uh, high seed set years in um, Valley Oak. So if you have a warm April, you tend to have a good, good acorn crop the following, following fall. And uh, really combined with that resources story that I was telling before, you can explain a really high uh, amount of the variation in seed set. So, uh, so if you know those two things, like if, if I know the temperature in April and the seed set the previous year, I can do a pretty good job of predicting what that acorn crop is going to be the following fall, which you know, is, is a pretty great party trick for at least two months out of the year. <laughs> Uh, but it does, so, and, and this does actually explain uh, much of the, um, the, all of these, uh, the properties of masting that I was talking about. You can get high variability in acorn crop, in part because of these resources, in part because of uh, weather between years. Uh, the periodicity, weather is kind of a periodic thing. You don't have an every other year uh, in terms of hot Aprils. And uh, high synchrony in acorn crop over large distances, weather takes place over large distances. Uh, but you know, how does this actually work? It's sort of a dissatisfying answer that uh, the trees care about this one peculiar aspect of their weather. Uh, so uh, what are oaks doing in April in uh, that part of the world? Uh, they are um, pollinating. Uh, so uh, really delved into uh, thinking about uh, how uh, about the pollination ecology of oaks and how different aspects of weather might uh, either promote or interrupt that process. So uh, the first thing I did was uh, to go out and just do a pollination study. So uh, it's actually been a very contentious issue as to whether pollination ever limits reproduction in oaks. Uh, you know, oaks produce gobs of pollen. Uh, the stuff tries and mates with people's noses and, you know, causes problems that way. Like, why would a tree ever be a, uh, at a loss for uh, pollen? Uh, so I went out and um, I uh, put these bags on trees and I either stuck uh, catkins from a, a whole bunch of other trees in them or not, uh, to try and see if I added pollen to uh, those trees, uh, would that increase acorn crops? And if, if there is, that's an evidence for uh, pollen limitation. So I did this in 2012 and didn't really see a whole lot. For whatever reason, I kept it up in 2013. And uh, sure enough, there, there was actually some evidence for uh, pollen limitation uh, in Valley Oak in a natural population that when I added pollen to those branches, they did produce more acorns. So uh, maybe pollination is more important than uh, previously thought, that pollen limitation can happen in oaks at least some years. And it's sort of appealing that it happened in one year but not another for this story, that uh, maybe this is something that the pollination environment changes year to year in oaks. Uh, so we thought about this further, and. One aspect of pollination that was uh, pretty clear from this population of oaks is that uh, the, f the flowering time of individuals was vastly different. So these are two individual oak trees that are, oh, I don't know, 20 meters apart or something like that. Uh, this picture taken March 7th, 2005, it looks like. And uh, the tree on the right is more or less a full flower, it looks like, and the tree on the left hasn't started. Those trees are right next to each other, but they probably won't mate, uh, because by the time the one has finished flowering, the other one, uh, um, by the time the one starts, the other one will have finished. So um, in any case, I thought that uh, maybe year-to-year -year variation in uh, how tight 
the flowering period is in oaks might be important for uh, their acorn production. So in some years, these trees will be separated in when they flower by a matter of weeks, and in some years, a matter of days. And uh, the thought was that maybe in hot April, everybody flowers more or less at the same time, and pollination just works really well. And if you have a cold April, everybody's spread out over several weeks, and pollen limitation occurs. And uh, this is uh, what I tested here. So uh, looking at the x-axis being the co coefficient of variation in bud burst, so basically how widely bud burst is spread across the season for these trees. And uh, on the y-axis is the acorn crop. So in these years with a big spread of bud burst, you tend to have a lower acorn crop than in the years with uh, a really compact bud burst. And uh, flowering takes place more or less uh, at some fixed interval after bud burst in these trees. Uh, one thing that uh, seemed to be driving this was the individual temperature or microclimates of uh, particular trees. So uh, during this period of time, had these little miniature temperature loggers out on all of those oak trees and found uh, here the x-axis is the spread of, uh, of temperatures that these trees in the population were experiencing. So uh, on uh, this side, individual trees are experiencing very different temperatures. And on this side, they're all more or less experiencing the same temperature in April. These tend to be the hot years. And uh, sure enough, uh, uh, the, that seems to be what's driving the uh, variation in bud break. So if you have a cold spring, you have this kind of, the microcyte dominates, and uh, there are, um, there's vast differences between uh, the temperature that individual trees experience. And uh, that causes bud break to happen over a longer period of time. And when you have bud break happening over a long period of time, uh, I'm arguing that you get greater pollen limitation and therefore a low seed set, that that might be the connection between this April temperature and, uh, and uh, acorn production. So uh, yeah, th this story works out pretty well for, uh, for Valley Oak. Uh, that uh, it, it seems like a very plausible explanation for uh, why they're producing uh, high and low uh, acorn years. Uh, really interested in knowing how this works for other oak species. And in particular, there's been some other work on, on different masting uh, species, so oaks are not the only thing that mast. These are a whole series of New Zealand plants that are really different from one another. They're grasses. There's uh, Nothophagus, a, a, a tree that's uh, down there, uh, and some forbs, all of which have this, uh, this high variation in their seed set. And uh, these authors found that all of them basically had the same weather cues that they used. So I uh, was interested in knowing, ah, is this more, is this true for all of plants that uh, do, is there this amazingly the same mechanism driving masting in a great number of things, as seems like is the case in New Zealand, uh, and specifically whether that was true in the oaks. So just going uh, into the all of plants thing a little bit, I put, just put together all of the seed set records I could get my hands on from uh, plants across the world. And uh, yeah, these spanned about uh, a century and a little bit more in, uh, in terms of the, the ups and downs of seed set. And uh, with that, uh, plotting them on the phylogeny of all of the plants, uh, just showing the ones here with the dark red labels, those are the ones that uh, have this high variability in seed set. And the ones with the more yellow labels have a low variability of seed set. So uh, masting is maybe not like an either or kind of thing, uh, but uh, you can see that the ones with uh, high variability of seed set are, are sort of spread across the tree of life. 
But there are some clusters of the tree of life or tree of plants, I guess, that uh, uh, tend to have masting more, and oaks are certainly one of those. So what I can say about uh, patterns across all of oaks uh, in terms of their seed set, do the same weather patterns drive mast years in all of oaks? Uh, so looking across these data sets of, uh, of seed set from other oak species, uh, the answer is resoundingly no. So this business of uh, hot Aprils holds true for valley oak, it holds true for a handful of other oak species, uh, but uh, it falls apart completely when we look beyond that much. And there are other correlates of uh, acorn set in uh, other oak species. So things like rainfall or temperature in different months and probably even other things that I haven't looked at. Uh, Another question is then, are there consistent trends in which oaks use the same set of weather patterns uh, for masting? So one idea could be that uh, geography uh, is something that uh, causes uh, species to use the, the same uh, sets of weather cues. So there's been uh, arguments, uh, a lot of them coming out of Spain, that water use is particularly important there. Uh, but uh, really, when I look through that data, that does not come out as being particularly important. That you can have species from roughly the same ge geographic area that tends to, whose acorn crops correlate with vastly different aspects of weather. Uh, leaf habit is another hypothesis that maybe evergreen and deciduous oaks are just doing different things. Uh, and uh, again, the answer is resoundingly no that uh, in the same area you, you have some evergreens and deciduous ones that use the same aspects of weather, and uh, you have uh, ones that are uh, evergreen, let's say, that use very different aspects of weather. Uh, and then phylogeny it was another one, that close relatives are just similar in a lot of different ways. So uh, maybe one of those ways is in how they respond to weather in, in terms of their seed set. Uh, and this was, uh, the answer to this was yes, that does seem to matter, that close relatives do tend to uh, have acorn crops that correlate with a similar set of weather patterns, uh, but the trend is fairly weak. So this, this doesn't uh, necessarily explain all of why different oaks use uh, different aspects of weather, but it explains some. And this is, uh, uh, eh, it's kind of a weird representation of that, but just showing that oak phylogeny that uh, people have seen a lot throughout this conference, uh, and trying to match that up with this thing here being a, a representation of similarity in the weather uh, correlates of seed set. So where two species are close together on this branching tree, uh, they tend to use similar aspects of weather. Uh, so if this matched perfectly all the lines, it goes straight across. Uh, when you run the numbers, it seems like, eh, it, phylogeny explains some of it, but not all. So the, the take home points for this is that in valley oaks, resources in weather, and specifically weather that has some direct mechanistic connection uh, to acorn crops via pollination uh, is a really plausible driver of masting. And we can explain a large portion of the variation in seed set with this, and it roughly makes sense conceptually. For other oaks, they still mast. Some of them uh, mast in relatively similar years as one another, but it seems like they're doing it uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, of the self, this is kind of interesting. So we have like plants from across the tree of life in New Zealand that seem to all use, all correlate with the same aspects of weather and when they produce seed crops. In this one, uh, one wonderful genus, uh, I, I would probably say like silly genus or something like that to any other group. But, uh, <laughs> but in this one wonderful genus, we have all sorts of uh, ways probably of uh, being masting, of having variable seed set. 